Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Sir John. Okay. So we're in the bottom of the ninth inning. <laughs> or we're in extra time if you're a European global football fan. We thought we would um, have a final session. We're going to break by 425, 428. Those of you who want to see Representative Adam Schiff, and I hope you do, we can walk over to Greenwald Tent. That begins at 5 o'clock. We thought we'd try to sum up what have we learned over the last uh, three days. What are the big issues and themes that emerge? And I can't think of any two of our participants who are better able to do that for us than two people who have spent decades, each of them, observing. Observing their friends, but mostly observing uh, rivals and enemies. Discerning thought patterns. <laughs> trying to delineate global trend lines that affect the United Kingdom and the United States of America. So John Scarlett, to my right, former chief of the Secret Intelligence Service of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland, otherwise known as MI6, the oldest continuously active intelligence service, he wants me to say, in the world. <laughs> Think James Bond, at least the boss of James Bond. And Sir John is a great friend of the United States and a great analyst. John McLaughlin, former acting director of the Central Intelligence Agency, former deputy director of the Central Intelligence Agency, former director of the Intelligence Directorate of the Central Intelligence Agency, former director of European Affairs of the Central Intelligence Agency, a comrade in arms uh, at the end of the Cold War. Uh, when we were trying to figure out what was happening to the Soviet Union, the Warsaw Pact countries. I was working for President George H.W. Bush along with Condoleezza Rice as the two-person Soviet team we called John to come in and brief President George H.W. Bush. And we're also joined by a great American patriot, Judge William Webster, former director of the CIA. Please join me in welcoming Judge Webster. So I, I told uh, the two Johns that I would ask them three questions based on three big themes. What do you think about what we've heard? And then we're going to open up to you. Let us know what you've heard. What are, your, uh, what are your takeaways? What are your questions for these two gentlemen? First question, running through every panel, and in fact, in our minds as we organize this conference, is the Trump administration has been absolutely right to say in their national security strategy and in the national military strategy that for the first time since 9-11, while terrorism is an abiding concern, the greater threat <clears throat> to the United States is the emergence, well, I shouldn't say emergence, the continuation of Russia and China as two great authoritarian powers dedicated to cut the United States and the United Kingdom down to size. Sir John? Do you agree with that? And, and listening to the conversation, do we in the West have the right policies to contain and limit these two countries? Well, Nick, thank you. Um, thank you for the introduction. Um, I do agree, uh, obviously, that uh, the reemergence of great power competition uh, is, you know, is a marked feature of the last few, of the last few years. Um, and it needs to be expressed uh, properly. And it has been clearly expressed in the national defense strategy, which is the right place to, um, to you know, broadcast it. Um, and it's caught um, attention. And it forces everybody to think about, well, what does that actually mean? I'm a bit concerned uh, that um, the, there's a tendency for the sort of non-state actor threat, because we're reacting against our previous sort of absolute focus on that, for it to be put to one side, or at least reduced in, uh, in prominence, and that, that process can slightly get out of control, and then you feel, oh, well, we've done that, we've won that, um, it's not such a big thing anymore. And uh, if you're coming from a background like me, um, and indeed you're worrying about the things you're worrying about you know, day by day, even now, um, and I know very well it hasn't gone away. Absolutely not. In fact, if you talk to the heads of the um, security agencies, certainly in Europe, 
they'll say that the threat level um, from terrorist activity is as high as it's ever been. Mm -hmm. um, we had five major attacks in the UK in 2017, and I can go on. So I just want to sort of make that point. So it's important not to oversimplify it. Mm -hmm. And uh, there is a risk, obviously, uh, that by talking about great power competition, we get into the word adversaries, and we've been hearing that a lot you know, in the last few days. And so what do we mean by adversary? What form can that take? Are we talking about a competitor? Um, fine, and some of us have been. <coughs> or are we talking about you know, a potential enemy? Well, in inevitably, potential enemy is the word, but potential is an important word, but you can quickly slip into enemy and drop the potential. Yeah. Uh, <coughs> and so it can become oversimplified as a debate. Uh, and I think we do have to be, uh, we do have to be uh, careful about that. Can I just say, too, in diplomacy, we choose words very carefully, as we do in intelligence. China and Russia are clearly competitors, rivals, adversaries. Enemy is someone you're about to fight. Yes. Right. It's, it's the wrong word for these two countries. Yes. Right. Uh, yes. Excuse me for interrupting. Um, <coughs> but then, of course, the issue is, well, um, you know, what are we actually talking about in practice? What are the, uh, where's the areas of competition? Where are the areas of difficulties? What are the challenges? And that's a huge and extremely interesting uh, debate. Um, certainly, if we're taking uh, China and Russia. By the way, I'd say that Russia um, and Russian uh, colleagues, certainly of mine, will be delighted to hear themselves being discussed at the same level <laughs> as China and uh, the United States. I mean, that is one of the key objectives that President Putin has had ever since he's been in power, yeah. is to get back to be taken you know, seriously at that level. But of course, they are um, very different. Uh, and, by, and I think it has come through from our discussion that by far the most complex challenge in the long term is from China. Uh, clearly, just because of the power of the economy, the extraordinary change in speed, um, which has happened over my career, um, uh, of Chinese power and, and success. Uh, and, uh, but at the same time, as a society, a very authoritarian, very authoritarian society, First of all, do we fully understand what that actually means? And for the first time, uh, uh, the Western world and liberal democracies, that, that's the expression I like, liberal democracies, um, we face a challenge from a very authoritarian state, which arguably, in some respects, is more successful than we are. And now that we have not faced uh, that uh, before. So it really needs thinking through, what does that, that mean? It's not a simple thing. Uh, Russia obviously is not in the same um, is not in the same category, but it has been said here that maybe it represents some in a more immediate sort of threat, if you like, or challenge because they feel the pressure more immediately, yeah. and therefore the risk of some sort of lashing out or some kind of misunderstanding um, uh, from uh, from Moscow uh, is maybe higher than uh, than from. Uh, uh, maybe a more slow-moving process in, in Beijing. Thank you. John McLaughlin, on this question, yeah. we refer <clears throat> colloquially to the rise of China, but actually it's the return of China yeah. to power. In 18 of the last 20 centuries, China was the world's glo uh, largest global economy. Right. Uh, Henry Kissinger, in his 2011 book on China, Brilliant, says it is a civilization right. that expects to be in power. Mm -hmm. And it's, is it clearly now a peer competitor of the United States? Well, Nick, I don't think it's there yet. Uh, when I think about China, uh, I think first kind of three, th two or three big realities here. First, it's complicated. That's, so we can't reduce it to simplicity terms. And when you said a few minutes ago, uh, not to use the word enemy, that's an important observation. Agreed. Yeah. We don't know yet really there's a kind of China fever rising in Washington, and it's appropriate that we recognize it as a, a serious competitor and challenger, and that we not be complacent about its, its uh, uh, chances of overtaking us in the world. But we don't really know yet whether the right term mm. is competitor, adversary. Do we have to rule out partners yet? If you think about one of the realities here, uh, and here is an important reality. These two countries, the United States and China, and their economies will affect the whole world for the rest of our lives. 
So this is a big responsibility for the United States, for the world, not just for America first. It's for the world. So we have to think about that. Also, with China, Nick, going to your point, I'm reminded of two things um, about them as a civilization. A friend of mine visited a Chinese museum. I won't describe the object, but it was an unusual object. And he asked the museum director, what is that thing? And he explained it, and he said, it's 1,300 years old. He said, you know, that was a good millennium. <laughs> Second story. I'm walking down the street in Beijing with a, uh, a former Chinese intelligence officer. We were both at a conference, and we were both playing that we weren't in that business anymore. Uh, I'm not, but I'm not sure about him. Uh, and and I, we passed, a, and this was some years ago, this was before Xi, but we passed a, a big poster of Mao there everywhere. And I said, tell me about Mao. And he said, Mao. He created modern China. Uh, Deng Xiaoping, he reformed our economy. Zhang Zemin, he took us into the world. Hu Jintao, he lifted us up. Now, I don't know what he'd say about Xi today. Maybe he's doing some repairs. I don't know. <laughs> but the point is, no American thinks that way. So. We need to understand that with China, they are looking to the future with a, a, a theory of coming from a distant past, looking to a glorious future. Uh, you know, we're worried about 2020. So we need to have that long-term perspective in dealing with China, and therefore we need to be very strategic and, and think far ahead. And there's an opportunity, I said to uh, one of our ambassadors here, uh, this is a really off the, but at, at the, at this forum, we could have off the wall ideas. Uh, we could change history. What if we could work out uh, a kind of understanding, if not a partnership, among China, Japan, and the United States? Now, I can make the argument about why that could never happen. But think about it. I'm going to leave you this one other thought. When we talk about rivals and adversaries, uh, what is it that we would really fight for? I mean fight. I mean deploy men, material, and inflict violence. What, what would we really fight for? Would it be in support of a, a treaty ally whose sovereignty was violated? I think so, but we have to think about that. Because another reality, I'm going to stop now, but another reality about these two relationships are they're complicated, we want to maintain our preeminence, but we really don't want to go to war. That's tricky. So on this first theme of China and Russia, how do we deal with authoritarian states, I would just say one thing. Our modern presidents have all had to deal with it's complicated, the complexity of the world. And I think that all of our recent presidents would be unified in saying that we're fighting a battle of strategic positioning in East Asia with the Chinese. We want to remain the most powerful. They want to replace us. We're fighting a battle for trade supremacy. That's happening right now. We're fighting a battle for techno the technological future. Who's going to dominate the AI quantum computing space? And we're fighting a battle of ideologies. JFK and Reagan were our foremost Thatcher proponents of the West, the idea of liberal democracy. Xi Jinping, if I can take John's unity, he has strengthened the party, and he's gone out to the rest of the world and said, our system is superior. The challenge for our presidents and our British prime ministers is balancing the competition in those four areas with what we need to do together with China. We are the two largest carbon emitters. We will not resolve car climate change without each other. And that was the President Obama, President Xi joint venture of 2015, the Paris Climate Accord. And if you think of trafficking of human beings, drug and crime cartels, all the transnational issues, pandemics, we can't do much without China. I think that balancing these two imperatives is going to be mm -hmm. vital. Mm -hmm. It's complicated. We can't see them as the enemy because we need them as well as we need to compete with them.
Is that fair enough, a summation? Well, I'm uh, picking up the word complicated. I'm, uh, I can't resist the temptation to say that um, uh, this is when I'm being asked a particularly difficult uh, question by my children, or in fact, one of my grandchildren now, and I, don't, I, I take it so far, and then I say, it's too complicated to explain. And they know that. Can I, can I just finish off there? Please. The, uh, but I'm just picking up the word challenge. Uh, Given all that we're saying about China, and as you've just said, uh, the reality is that liberal democracies, but maybe particularly, obviously, the United States, it's just going to... And what does that actually mean in day-to-day -day conduct of business? Um, you know, yes, you can have a sort of sense of competition in Asia, for example, or Southeast Asia, um, or almost anywhere in Eastern Europe, and in Central Europe, and in Latin America. Uh, but at the same time, you're going to have to be working together on a whole range mm -hmm. of, of things. This is much more complicated mm -hmm. than was the case, or has been the case in the past. That's a really major and complicated challenge. It needs a really careful thought. And the second point, which is completely different, and I did try to bring it out in one of my questions um, uh, a couple of days ago, is that with Russia, and we're seeing that as a different issue, uh, how do you manage to conduct that a very important relationship and good mutual understanding and effective dialogue at the same time as dealing with challenging behaviour of the kind that the UK in particular has had to face is a really difficult issue. Right. Theme yeah, another, complex, another part of the complexity here <clears throat> is that the United States, while we have these rising powers as rivals, uh, and I associate myself completely with Sir John's point about uh, don't lose sight of terrorism because in my old business, that's where the biggest surprises would come from. Uh, I'll just leave it at that. Uh, but the United States has not had a lot of practice in the kind of world we're in now. Some people say, oh, it's like the 1930s. No, it's no. not. No, it's not. Because in the 1930s, we were not yet the global leader. We became the global leader as a result of and in the aftermath of World War II. And all we've known since then, 70 years of Cold War, a bilateral competition that we won, and then... 17 years between the fall of the Soviet Union and the 2008 financial crisis when we were number one and unchallenged. And then from there to here, we're in a new world where as a global leader with all of these privileges and uh, such, we're being challenged for the first time. So it's not a world that we have practice in. And it's not a world we have a label for. You know, we've always yeah. had a label. Civil War, preserve the Union. World War I, safe for democracy. World War II, defeat the Nazis. Cold War, contain the Soviets. What's the label today? That is such a challenging question. And I would say the biggest threat to us right now is not Russia and China. It's ourselves, meaning, and I'm not talking politics, it's the assault on democracy by the right-wing anti-democratic populists like Marine Le Pen and Geert Wilders in Europe and Alternative for Deutschland. And so we need to revive the West. Of course we need to contain these two powers. We need to strengthen our democracies, mm -hmm. gain some self-confidence mm -hmm. that we are the exceptional country mm -hmm. and alliance, and that the democratic countries of the world have the superior system, defend that, revive the West. What do you think? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Um, because we, as we're thinking of China, I mean, you referred earlier to this. We, of course, could never imagine China as a model, but there are people in the world who could. Yeah. Yeah. You know, they, they can see uh, this is a country that has very tight political control and seems to be growing economically. Some economists say they'll be twice our size economically if they don't have some disruption between now and 2050. So there are people in the world, if our system falters, you know, that they will push their system. Now, I'm not suggesting anyone wants to be led by China, including most of their neighbors who are just desperately afear, afraid that we will not be robustly present. The people of Hong Kong. The people of Hong Kong. So I don't want to overstate that, but uh, certainly agree, Nick, that uh, fix ourselves here. <laughs> When I say at home, I mean among the liberal democracies, starting with the wonderful special relationship with we have with the UK. We, we've now drifted into theme two, and I would ask Sir John and John to comment. I think in every panel, including on just this last panel, 
nearly all the speakers have said the United States works best when we work with Canada, when we work with the UK, NATO, our East Asian allies, that alliances actually don't weaken us, they actually magnify our power. How are we doing in a complicated world in taking advantage of our democratic alliances? If um, I come on to that, because it's a really interesting uh, question, but just to pick up, because I didn't answer your previous point about the uh, sort of, if, if you like, uh, threat to our own systems from rising populism and so on, I, I just have to say that um, over the last two or three years, I've been in so many discussions about populism, uh, very often from sort of academics and think tankers and intellectuals in Paris or somewhere. And I come away thinking, nobody here knows what the word means. And, and I don't know what it means exactly either. So um, I think you know, understanding what we really mean there and talking about is, is a huge subject in, in, it, yes. in its own right. So I'm just sort of putting down a marker on, on the word uh, and the concept of, um, of populism. You're right. And that's why I modified it by saying anti-democratic populism. Mm. Marine Le Pen, Alternative for Deutschland, Viktor Orban, Salvini in Italy. That's yeah. the threat. Yeah, but the complication is that Salvini in Italy gets a lot of votes. So it's, uh, anyway. It's complicated. It's complicated. <laughs> <laughs> uh, allies are Too not. complicated. Now, on <laughs> allies uh, are not complicated. On, on, um, uh, on uh, allies, yes. Uh, it's very interesting and, and uh, really sort of thought-provoking the way that's come out from our discussions and here. And it just brings forward, we're talking here about, you know, the great powers and China and the United States and perhaps Russia and so on. Uh, uh, but, you know, what marks the United States out? Um, and, of course, it is allies. And it's allies not just in a traditional sort of great power uh, sense, but in a much deeper sense. Um, it, it's fundamentally linked to shared history, uh, shared experiences, um, to, um, there's a great deal of emotion in it. Um, there's a great deal of commitment in it. Um, when I'm, you know, talking here, uh, obviously from the point of view of, of one ally, but you know the other allies uh, that I know, um, just a belief uh, in uh, the basically beneficial leadership um, and positive leadership of the United States of America. Um, that you know, I've I once said in, to an audience in the, in the U.S. that I'd bet my whole professional life on that, and they all stood up and cheered. <laughs> don't, don't, don't do that now. But it actually is a true statement, and it's true for pretty well all my, all my colleagues and, and, and my country, actually. Um, and this is, a, uh, this is a sort of huge and fundamental point. Uh, uh, so, um, you know, that's... Uh, I just want to, that somehow... And, and, that, and that doesn't absolutely doesn't exist. And, and it's not... I mean, China doesn't really have any allies right. as such. Right, right, and, right. And in fact, it has almost a deliberate policy of not having permanent um, and, allies. And neither does Russia. And, uh, um, well, Russia might claim to have some allies, but not many of them are volunteers. Yeah. So, <laughs> <laughs> That's good. So, <laughs> so um, uh, equally, it's so tied up with territorial issues and ethnic issues and yeah, so on. Yeah. But actually, that's a slightly loose um, reply from me there because... It, it, it cuts across traditional national boundaries, and it's rather, it's rather different. Um, uh, but it, you know, it's worth also making the basic point: there's a fundamental difference uh, between um, between uh, uh, the great powers, and it really must be understood here in the United States. Thank you. Yeah, when I when you ask that question, Nick, I you know you may recall I spent uh, a year on detail with the State Department, <coughs> and I was lucky enough to be there during the um, leadership of George Shultz. Yes. Great Secretary of State. Yes, he was. And George Schultz always said, uh, diplomacy is about tending the garden. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And he didn't, he didn't mean spending more. You know, it's, it's not about how much you spend. It's about how you feel. It's about constantly being in touch with those with whom you are allied, talking to them, calling them, uh, not expecting much in return. Uh, it's the same in the intelligence world, by the way. Uh, there's a in our relations with foreign intelligence services. And um, the, the one final point I'd make about alliances is if we are in a world where our preeminence is challenged and where China is growing at a rate that will challenge us in terms of not being able to spend our way, we won't be able to spend our way to leadership. For alliances then become your force multiplier because China doesn't have any. <laughs>
Right. It's the force multiplier. Yeah. And if we don't handle that well, we are just flushing it away. I'm going to, um, so true. I want to open this up to questions, but just a very, very brief story to illustrate John, John's point and Sir, and Sir John's point. On 9-11, when we were hit very hard, 3,000 people dead in three of our states, uh, I was the very, very new 12 days ambassador at NATO. We Americans and the Brits, I think, had always assumed from the early Cold War period, 1949 forward, that if if NATO had to go to war, it would be the United States and Canada crossing the pond a third time in the 20th century to defend Europe. So the huge irony of 9-11 was that our allies came to us in Brussels, to my mission, to me, and said, we want to invoke Article 5, an attack on one of the treaty, NATO treaty, is, shall be deemed an attack on all. We were attacked. My Canadian colleague, and I give him huge credit, David Wright, called and said, have you thought about invoking Article 5? We operate by consensus. Every ally had to agree. I had just come from Greece where I was ambassador. I was worried about the Greeks. By that evening, <laughs> by midnight in Brussels, every ally had agreed to go to war with us. The next morning, at 10 a.m. <coughs> Brussels time, I called Condoleezza Rice, the national security advisor, four in the morning. I said, Condi, the allies want to invoke Article 5. They want to go to war with us. I need the president's permission. She said, go for it. I said, but I need the president's personal permission. I'm going to cast this vote. She said, go for it. <laughs> and then I said, but Condi, and she interrupted me, and she said, Nick, the president's had the worst day. Go for it. I said, I'll take that as my presidential instruction. She said, one more thing. It's good to have friends in the world. It's good to have friends in the can world. I, can and I you know, can, if I could just, that was, she wrote about that in her memoirs. For any American to reflect that on our worst day, everybody stood up for us, that everybody went into Afghanistan, that everyone, they're still there today, mm. every NATO ally, and they've suffered 1,000 combat deaths. The Russians and Chinese have no one willing to stand up, and we have our allies. May we treat them well. Excuse May, me. Can I add a personal story on Please. that same theme? Please. Yes. And, it, and it tells you something about the two countries represented right here. On that day, the day after 9-11, you could imagine what the CIA was like. Uh, a plane arrived bearing the head of the MI6, John's predecessor. The head and of his body as well. Uh, I'm and, sorry? and his body as well. And <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, okay. You, th thanks for that because, yeah. Thank you for that moment of levity. <laughs> thanks for that because I was about to lose it. My point was this: the the head of the British intelligence service, the head of the British SIGINT service, GCHQ, and the national, uh, essentially their uh, foreign policy advisor for the prime minister, yeah. arrived on a plane to embrace the CIA leadership the day after 9-11, yeah. at a time when all of our airspace was closed. By the way, I don't know how you guys did that. <laughs> but uh, it's that old James Bond thing. Uh, but, uh, but it was enormously gratifying to us to, be, uh, to know we had that kind of support on the worst day in our lives. And I I think that um, Americans who've served uh, throughout our government, in the State Department, Defense Department, the intelligence agencies, feel emotionally connected to our allies. Because as Jens Stoltenberg said to us on the very first yes. night, it's not about money and it's not about power. It's about s democracy surviving and prospering. And that is the spirit we have to have about the United Kingdom, about Canada, which is represented here today and about all of our allies. Yes, agreed. It was a very powerful Last word to you, from, sir. Uh, a very powerful statement from Jens Stoltenberg. It was. Uh, you know, our power rests on being together yeah. and being credible. Out to you. Amen. Yes, sir. And we'll wait for the mic right down here in front. <clears throat> Oops. <laughs> Good catch. Good catch, yeah. 
uh, Mark Davis, perhaps because I'm a child of the 50s and 60s, um, where it seemed like we had an existential military threat literally every day. I recall the old retention drills, which some of you remember <laughs> when we were going to hide from the Russians by uh, you know, pulling down the blinds of, uh, of our windows in our school. Um, I don't view, and I'd like the, you guys to comment, um, I don't view the threat from China as being that way. It, it just doesn't seem as if it would make any logical sense for China to destroy its greatest market militarily. Could you comment on the, the relative threats militarily of uh, both this, uh, these great powers as we've been talking about? <coughs> Well, that picks up a you know, point that I think we were uh, all trying to make um, um, earlier on, uh, that uh, the word, I think the word threat, you know, we've got to be careful about that too. Uh, we are talking about a completely different uh, situation from uh, what you describe uh, um, in the sort of classic height of the Cold, Cold War. Um, and um, it, it's, uh, it, it's, it's much more sort of complex, and the way the relationship is managed and, and understood it, there are so many layers to it, and you know, again, we could spend sort of ages talking about it. The, the points that sort of stay in my mind uh, are um, the reality of economic power, and at the end of the day, you know, it goes back to that. And and uh, uh, and China is clearly up there already, and going to be even further ahead, almost certainly in in the period ahead. At the same time, the reality of Chinese society which is, I mean, as somebody said earlier on, has nothing to do with communism, even though it's a communist party. It's to do with um, authoritarianism, very tight control with massive use of uh, changing technology to support it. And understanding that, seeing what it means in practice day by day, um, and then how do we sort of manage an effective, constructive, peaceful relationship with that is really uh, complicated. But at the same time, not totally excluding uh, the military point uh, at all, because those military issues potentially are there. We've touched on them in, in some questions. It's not like, you know, you're describing uh, sitting in shelters um, in 1962 or whatever, um, or maybe it was later than that, sorry. Um, but, the, um, but, you know, there are classic territorial issues, uh, South China Sea being one obvious one, and uh, the Taiwan Straits, which may be quite historical, but I think may be a deeper issue, actually, and a more emotional issue as far as Beijing is concerned. Uh, and so the risk of a misunderstanding of a classic kind is certainly uh, not going to go away. Uh, and, and so our thinking has to be at all those different levels. Um, but your basic point you know, from history is correct, of course. Thank you. I don't have to add anything to that. Okay, right here. Thank you. <clears throat> I'll be blunt. Do you think this president is going to destroy the alliances that you took so long and hard to build, that everybody in this room is working long and hard to build? John McLaughlin. Um, they're in danger, uh, is the way I would put it. Um, I think there is confusion among the allies about who to believe in the United States. Uh, certainly a number of us go over and say, these alliances are strong, we're with you, and so forth. Uh, but all it takes is a, a you know, a tweet or two, and, and they, uh, they, they're confused about where we really are, uh, I think. So I, I don't think we're going to see them destroyed, but I think because of what we said earlier, what I said, and I think everyone is saying, uh, alliances are as much about how you feel as about what you do. Now, I could, I could cite a number of things that NATO is doing that are quite impressive on the ground. But I know from traveling around in Europe and talking to people that people don't feel close to us. They, work, they, work, they don't, just don't know where we are. So I would say they're in danger but not destroyed. Uh, is that fair? Uh, I'd, um, I, I'd pick that up. I mean, it's sorry to be boring because uh, you know, essentially we're saying uh, the same thing. Um, it, it's, um, 
of course the headlines and the tweets and so on can create a certain impression because they get instant coverage and uh, massive, uh, they go viral and so on. Uh, but um, at the same time, you know, underneath, uh, throughout our respective machines and governments and economies and goodness knows what else, uh, there's just such fundamental linkage and it goes so deep uh, that we have to remember that and not be distracted by the, you know, the perennial uh, or the, the passing um, headlines. Uh, that's, the, um, that's the first point. Um, the second point is I very much pick up um, uh, this. And obviously, it's very important that the leadership on all sides understand and the value of their, of our, it's not just alliance, alliance is probably not quite the right word, it's a deep relationship. Um, and perhaps they do, really. You know. um, and so it's important not to become too gloomy. I would, but here, here's a concrete danger, though. Um, okay. yeah. I, I, I feel I don't want to be too reassuring, <clears throat> but I also don't want to say it's over because we can't give up. Uh, if we neglect allies, as we have in some cases, and we do it long enough, they'll start to make their own arrangements. We see this by pulling out of the Trans-Pacific Partnership, which was a foolish move on the part of the president, um, which involved you know, many nations in Asia. Uh, that would have been a wonderful platform from which to organize a, um, an understanding about how to deal with China. Well, many of the Asian nations have gone off now and started to make their own arrangements on trade, and we're in a trade war with China. So that's not how you that's not how you make alliances prosper. Okay, I would just say that um, the president has been heedless of Japan and South Korea. He's not treated them right. He's prioritized his relationships with Xi Jinping and Kim Jong Un. And on NATO, where I was ambassador for a Republican president, George W. Bush, um, he sees the European Union as a competitor. And the president is a unilateralist. He believes the United States should act really alone in the world. And he has been destructive of our alliance. The biggest issue in Europe is the assault on democracy by the anti-democratic populists. The president has sided with Salvini, the fascist leader of the Liga, and with Viktor Orban, the authoritarian leader of Hungary, and with the Polish government. And he's consistently sought to undermine Angela Merkel and Theresa May. Today, he tweeted out against the mayor of London. He's the weakest American president we've ever had on the NATO alliance. And I can say and he is the greatest threat to that alliance. Now, now we're that's getting, yeah, we're getting going now. <laughs> <laughs> I can say something that Sir John can't, which is I found it appalling that he insulted Theresa May. Terrible. Uh, given the reception that Theresa May gave him and his family in London. I found that appalling. No American president would ever do that, particularly when Theresa May is down on her luck, so to speak, politically. You know, you just don't do that. So um, we are out of time because we have to get you over to see Congressman Schiff, but um, there are going to be lots of time for questions there. Can I try to end in a high note? Today's a great day for America. My wife Libby and our two grandchildren and our daughter Sarah and son-in-law are preparing a Apollo 11 party. They sent me photos back in Westport, Massachusetts. What a great achievement, Apollo 11. The men and women of NASA, what a great achievement. The female and male engineers at NASA, our astronauts, the incredible vision of President Kennedy, our military, everyone who produced Gemini and Apollo, it was one of the great achievements in the whole history of the country. And so I think the question for us to reflect upon from these three days, we are a great country. And we can be, and we can be great again. We can be great again. We need to be self-confident about ourselves. Nick, Ambassador. Every one of these uh, <laughs> security forums, this has been the most Three days of the most stimulating, exciting, and informative uh, discussions, and thank you. Thank you. So may I thank all of our participants, everyone who spoke up here, who moderated the panel, all of the great journalists. We believe in the freedom of the press. The press is the friends of our democracy. 
Thank you to all of you who came. And thank you to our great corporate sponsors. We wouldn't be here without them. They're all listed here. We'll see you at the tent uh, to see that great interview with Adam Schiff. Thank you very much. The final session will be at the Greenwald Tent at 5 p.m.